Chapter 30, Ellen G. White's Use of Remedial Agencies Ellen G. White speaks repeatedly of simple remedies. She tells us specifically what she means when she thus speaks, naming pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, and trust in divine power. See pages 287 and 291 and the Ministry of Healing, page 127. In addition to these, Mrs. White on a few occasions in her personal correspondence made reference to certain simple medications she knew and used. Any such remedy was usually mentioned in a single instance only. She also refers in her correspondence to a few rare emergency situations that led her to employ remedies she would not use except in a crisis. In evaluating these references to certain medications, four points should be observed by the reader. The following pages list the significant statements in which Mrs. White mentions specific medications of a simple character. Insofar as such statements were known at the time this compilation was made. A very few pages are required to place these statements in print, some 11 pages as compared with the more than 2,000 pages devoted to the comprehensive presentation of the health councils as found in the E.G. White books. For 50 years, Mrs. White wrote extensively for publication on the subject of health and the care of the sick, but it is an interesting and significant fact that except for the brief mention of the lump of figs for Hezekiah's boils, and a fleeting allusion to the ineffectual use of simple herbs in the illness of one of her sons, see Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 104, she made no reference to the medicinal use of herbs or to other specific simple medications in any of her published statements. To say the least, this fact does not permit the conclusion that the use of herbs is of prime importance in the whole health program that she set forth in such completeness. Mrs. White nowhere states, in discussing such simple medications, that other and more effective medications might not later be found. Owing to the impressions held by some that Mrs. White's writings not only endorse herbs, but feature them as the principal means for dealing with disease, and that there is a great abundance of unpublished material on this point, the White trustees believe that the minds of Seventh-day Adventists will be helped and the record best be kept clear by printing the statements that follow. In all fairness, the reader should not attach to these statements greater significance than did the author, who in her published works placed before the general public the broad principles to be followed in the treatment of the sick, the compilers. I cannot testify in their favor. After seeing so much harm done by the administering of drugs, I cannot use them and cannot testify in their favor. I must be true to the light given me by the Lord. The treatment we gave when the sanitarium was first established required earnest labor to combat disease. We did not use drug concoctions. We followed hygienic methods. This work was blessed by God. It was a work in which the human instrumentality could cooperate with God in saving life. There should be nothing put into the human system that would leave its baleful influence behind. And to carry out the light on this subject, to practice hygienic treatment, and to educate on altogether different lines of treating the sick, was the reason given me why we should have sanitariums established in various localities. I have been pained when many students who have been encouraged to go to a state-operated medical college to which a number of our early medical workers were sent to complete their training, to receive an education in the use of drugs. The light which I have received has placed an altogether different complexion on the use made of drugs that is given at this place or at the sanitarium. We must become enlightened on these subjects. The intricate names given the medicines are used to cover up the matter so that none will know what is given them as remedies unless they obtain a dictionary to find out the meaning of these names. The Lord has given some simple herbs of the field that at times are beneficial, and if every family were educated in how to use these herbs in case of sickness, much suffering might be prevented and no doctor need be called. 
These old-fashioned simple herbs used intelligently would have recovered many sick who have died under drug medication. One of the most beneficial remedies is pulverized charcoal placed in a bag and used in fomentations. This is a most successful remedy. If wet in smart weed boiled, it is still better. I have ordered this in cases where the sick were suffering great pain, and when it has been confided to me by the physician that he thought it was the last before the close of life. Then I suggested the charcoal, and the patient slept. The turning point came, and the recovery was the result. It is of interest to observe, in connection with the several E.G. White statements concerning the value of charcoal, that as well as being a product of frequent medical prescription, a 1,160-page professional work, Clinical Toxicology of Commercial Products, Williams and Wilkins, 1957, advises as an antidote for many known poisons and for all poisonous substances of unknown ingredients, a universal antidote of four parts, two of which are activated charcoal, the compilers. To students when injured with bruised hands and suffering with inflammation, I have prescribed this simple remedy with perfect success. The poison of inflammation was overcome, the pain removed, and the healing went on rapidly. The most severe inflammation of the eyes will be relieved by a poultice of charcoal put in a bag and dipped in hot or cold water as will best suit the case. This works like a charm. I expect you will laugh at this, but if I could give this remedy some outlandish name that no one knew but myself, it would have greater influence. But the simplest remedies may assist nature and leave no baleful effects after their use. Letter 82 1897, to Dr. J. H. Kellogg. When asked for counsel, simple remedies advised. There are many simple herbs which, if our nurses were to learn the value of, they could use in the place of drugs and find very effective. Many times I have been applied to for advice as to what should be done in cases of sickness or accident, and I have mentioned some of these simple remedies, and they have proved helpful. On one occasion, a physician came to me in great distress. He had been called to attend a young woman who was dangerously ill. She had contracted fever while on the campground and was taken to our school building near Melbourne, Australia. But she became so much worse that it was feared she could not live. The physician, Dr. Merritt Kylog, came to me and said, Sister White, have you any light for me on this case? If relief cannot be given our sister, she can live but a few hours. I replied, send to a blacksmith's shop and get some pulverized charcoal, make a poultice of it and lay it over her stomach and sides. The doctor hastened away to follow out my instructions. Soon he returned saying, relief came in less than half an hour after the application of the poultices. She is now having the first natural sleep she has had for days. I have ordered the same treatment for others who were suffering great pain and it has brought relief and been the means of saving life. My mother has told me that snake bites and the stings of reptiles and poisonous insects could often be rendered harmless by the use of charcoal poultices. When working on the land at Avondale, Australia, the workmen would often bruise their hands and limbs, and this in many cases resulted in such severe inflammation that the worker would have to leave his work for some time. One came to me one day in this condition with his hand tied in a sling. He was much troubled over the circumstance, for his help was needed in clearing the land. I said to him, Go to the place where you have been burning timber and get some charcoal from the eucalyptus tree. Pulverize it, and I will dress your hand. This was done, and the next morning he reported that the pain was gone. Soon he was ready to return to his work. I write these things that you may know that the Lord has not left us without the use of simple remedies, which, when used, will not leave the system in the weakened condition in which the use of drugs so often leaves it. We need well-trained nurses who can understand how to use the simple remedies that nature provides for restoration to health, and who can teach those who are ignorant of the laws of health how to use these simple but effective cures. He who created men and women has an interest in those who suffer. 
He has directed in the establishment of our sanitariums and the building up of schools close to our sanitariums that they may become efficient mediums in training men and women for the work of ministering to the suffering humanity. In the treatment of the sick, poisonous drugs need not be used. Alcohol and, or tobacco in any form must not be recommended, lest some soul be led to imbibe a taste for these evil things. Letter 90, 1908, to J.A. Burden and others bearing responsibility at Loma Linda. Safe, Simple Remedies In regard to that which we can do for ourselves, there is a point that requires careful, thoughtful consideration. I must become acquainted with myself. I must be a learner, always as how to take care of this building, the body God has given me, so that I may preserve it in the very best condition of health. I must eat those things which will be for my very best good physically, and I must take special care to have my clothing such as will conduce to a healthful circulation of the blood. I must not deprive myself of exercise and air. I must get all the sunlight that is possible for me to obtain. I must have wisdom to be a faithful guardian of my body. I should show myself an unwise steward to allow myself to sit in a draft and thus expose myself so as to take cold. I should be unwise to sit with cold feet and limbs, and thus drive back the blood from the extremities to the brain or internal organs. I should always protect my feet in damp weather. I should eat regularly of the most healthful food, which will make the best quality of blood, and I should not work intemperately if it is in my power to avoid doing so. And when I violate the laws God has established in my being, I am to repent and reform and place myself in the most favorable condition under the doctors God has provided, pure air, pure water, and the healing precious sunlight. Water can be used in many ways to relieve suffering. Drafts of clear hot water taken before eating, half a quart more or less, will never do any harm, but will rather be productive of good. A cup of tea made from catnip herb will quiet the nerves. Hop tea will induce sleep. Hop poultices over the stomach will relieve pain. If the eyes are weak, if there is pain in the eyes or inflammation, soft fennel cloths wet in hot water and salt will bring relief quickly. When the head is congested, if the feet and limbs are put in a bath with a little mustard, relief will be obtained. There are many more simple remedies which will do much to restore healthful action to the body. All these simple preparations the Lord expects us to use for ourselves, but man's extremities are God's opportunities. If we neglect to do that which is within the reach of nearly every family and ask the Lord to relieve pain when we are too indolent to make use of these remedies within our power, it is simply presumption. The Lord expects us to work in order that we may obtain food. He does not propose that we shall gather the harvest unless we break the sod, till the soil, and cultivate the produce. Then God sends the rain and sunshine and the clouds to cause vegetation to flourish. God works and man cooperates with God. Then there is seed time and harvest. God has caused to grow out of the ground herbs for the use of man, and if we understand the nature of those roots and herbs and make a right use of them, there would not be a necessity of running for the doctor so frequently, and people would be in much better health than they are today. I believe in calling upon the great physician when we have used the remedies I have mentioned. Letter 35, 1890, to a worker in an overseas field. Counsel to the medical director of a new sanitarium. Do all that you possibly can to perfect the institution inside and out. Be sure that your premises are in the best of order. Let there be nothing about them that will make a disagreeable impression on the minds of the patients. Encourage the patients to live healthfully and to take an abundance of exercise. This will do much to restore them to health. Let seats be placed under the shade of the trees that the patients may be encouraged to spend much time out of doors. And a place should be provided enclosed either with canvas or with glass where in cooler weather the patients can sit in the sun without feeling the wind. Fresh air and sunshine, cheerfulness within and without the institution, pleasant words and kindly acts, 
These are the remedies that the sick need, and God will crown with success your efforts to provide these remedies for the sick ones who come to the sanitarium. By happiness and cheerfulness and expressions of sympathy and hopefulness for others, your own soul will be filled with light and peace. And never forget that the sunshine of God's blessing is worth everything to us. Teach nurses and patients the value of those health-restoring agencies that are freely provided by God and the usefulness of simple things that are easily obtained. I will tell you a little about my experience with charcoal as a remedy. For some forms of indigestion, it is more efficacious than drugs. A little olive oil into which some of this powder has been stirred tends to cleanse and heal. I find it is excellent. Pulverized charcoal from eucalyptus wood we have used freely in cases of inflammation. Always study and teach the use of the simplest remedies, and the special blessing of the Lord may be expected to follow the use of these means which are within the reach of the common people. Letter 100, 1903. Other experiences with charcoal. A rapid recovery. A brother was taken sick with inflammation of the bowels and a bloody dysentery. The man was not a careful health reformer, but indulged his appetite. We were just preparing to leave Texas, where we had been laboring for several months, and we had carriages prepared to take away this brother and his family, and several others who were suffering from malarial fever. My husband and I thought we would stand this expense rather than have the heads of several families die and leave their wives and children unprovided for. Two or three were taken in a large spring wagon on spring mattresses, but this man who was suffering from inflammation of the bowels sent for me to come to him. My husband and I decided that it would not do to move him. Fears were entertained that mortification had set in. Then the thought came to me like a communication from the Lord to take pulverized charcoal, put water upon it, and give this water to the sick man to drink, putting bandages of the charcoal over the bowels and stomach. We were about one mile from the city of Denison, but the sick man's son went to a blacksmith shop, secured the charcoal and pulverized it, and then used it according to the directions given. The result was that in a half an hour there was a change for the better. We had to go on our journey and leave the family behind, but what was our surprise the following day to see their wagon overtake us. The sick man was lying in bed in the wagon. The blessing of God had worked with the simple means used. Letter 182, 1899, to a worker in an overseas field. Charcoal and Flaxseed We need a hospital so much. On Thursday, Sister Sarah McEnterfer, a trained nurse of experience well qualified for this type of service who accompanied Mrs. White and assisted her both as a traveling companion and private secretary, was called to see if she could do anything for Brother B's little son, who is 18 months old. For several days he has had a painful swelling on the knee, supposed to be from the bite of some poisonous insect. Pulverized charcoal mixed with flaxseed was placed upon the swelling, and this poultice gave relief at once. The child had screamed with pain all night, but when this was applied, he slept. Today she has been to see the little one twice. She opened the swelling in two places, and a large amount of yellow matter and blood was discharged freely. The child was relieved of its great suffering. We thank the Lord that we may become intelligent in using the simple things within our reach to alleviate pain and successfully remove its cause. Manuscript 68, 1899, General Manuscript. Other Remedies Mentioned A Poultice of Figs for Hezekiah When Hezekiah was sick, the prophet of God brought him the message that he should die. The king cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and sent the promise that fifteen years should be added to his life. One word from God, one touch of the divine finger, would have been enough to cure Hezekiah instantly. But instead he was given directions to make a poultice of figs and lay it upon the part affected. This was done, and Hezekiah was restored to health. It would be well to treasure this prescription which the Lord ordered to be used more than we do. Manuscript 29, 1911 
the value of eucalyptus oil. I am very sorry to learn that Sister C is not well. I cannot advise any remedy for her cough better than eucalyptus and honey. Into a tumbler of honey put a few drops of the eucalyptus. Stir it up well and take whenever the cough comes on. I have had considerable trouble with my throat, but whenever I use this I overcome the difficulty very quickly. I have to use it only a few times and the cough is removed. If you will use this prescription, you may be your own physician. If the first trial does not effect a cure, try it again. The best time to take it is before retiring. Letter 348, 1908, to a worker. I have already told you the remedy I use when suffering from difficulties with my throat. I take a glass of boiled honey, and into this I put a few drops of eucalyptus oil, stirring it in well. When the cough comes on, I take a teaspoonful of this mixture, and relief comes almost immediately. I have always used this with the best of results. I ask you to use the same remedy when you are troubled with the cough. This prescription may seem so simple that you feel no confidence in it, but I have tried it for a number of years and can highly recommend it. Again, take warm foot baths into which have been put the leaves of the eucalyptus tree. There is great virtue in these leaves, and if you will try this, you will prove my words to be true. The oil of the eucalyptus is especially beneficial in cases of cough and pains in the chest and lungs. I want you to make a trial of this remedy which is so simple and which costs you nothing. Letter 20, 1909, to the worker addressed in the preceding item. Trees with Medicinal Properties the Lord has been giving me light in regard to many things. He has shown me that our sanitarium should be erected on as high an elevation as is necessary to secure the best results, and that they are to be surrounded by extensive tracts of land, beautified by flowers and ornamental trees. In a certain place, preparations were being made to clear the land for the erection of a sanitarium. Light was given that there is health in the fragrance of the pine, the cedar, and the fir. There are several other kinds of trees that have medicinal properties that are health-promoting. Let not such trees be ruthlessly cut down. Let them live. Letter 95, 1902. To workers in the South. My herb drink. We need not go to China for our tea or to Java for our coffee. Some have said, Sister White uses tea, she keeps it in her house, and that she has placed it before them to drink. They have not told the truth, because I do not use it, neither do I keep it in my house. Once when crossing the waters I was sick and re could retain nothing on my stomach, and I did take a little weak tea as a medicine, but I don't want any of you again to make the remark that Sister White uses tea. If you will come to my house, I will show you the bag that contains my herb drink. I send to Michigan, across the mountains, and get the red clover top. In regard to coffee, I never could drink it. So those who reported that Sister White drinks coffee made a mistake. Manuscript 3, 1888. Sermon, Oakland, California. Clover Blossoms, First Crop. I have a request to make. Will these children please gather me as much clover or even more than they did last year? If they can do this, they will do me a great favor. I cannot do it here. We have no clover on our ground. The first crop is preferable, but if this comes... Too late, the second crop had better be secured. Letter 1, 1872, to a family in Michigan. Tea used as a medicine, but not as a beverage. I do not use tea, either green or black. Not a spoonful has passed my lips for many years, except when crossing the ocean. And once since on this side, I took it as a medicine when I was sick and vomiting. In such circumstances, it may prove a present relief. I did not use tea when you were with us. I have always used red clover top, as I stated to you. I offered you this and told you it was a good, simple, and wholesome drink. I have not bought a penny's worth of tea for years. Knowing its influence, I would not dare use it, except in cases of severe vomiting, when I take it as a medicine, but not as a beverage. I do not preach one thing and practice another. I do not present to my hearers rules of life for them to follow, while I make an exception in my own case. I am not guilty of drinking any tea except red clover top tea, 
And if I loved wine, tea, and coffee, I would not use these health-destroying narcotics. For I prize health, and I prize a healthful example in all these things. I want to be a pattern of temperance and of good work to others. Letter 12, 1888, to a minister on the West Coast. Coffee as Medicine I have not knowingly drunk a cup of genuine coffee for twenty years, only, as I stated, during my sickness for a medicine. I drank a cup of coffee, very strong, with a raw egg broken into it. Letter 20, 1882, to friends. Grape juice and eggs. I have received light that you are injuring your body by a poverty-stricken diet. It is a lack of suitable food that has caused you to suffer so keenly. You have not taken the food essential to nourish your frail physical strength. You must not deny yourself of good wholesome food. Get eggs of healthy fowls. Use these eggs cooked or raw. Drop them uncooked into the best unfermented wine you can find. This will supply that which is necessary to your system. Eggs contain properties which are remedial agencies in counteracting poisons. Councils on Diet and Foods pages 203 and 204, to Dr. D.H. Kress, 1901. Approval of Progressive Medical Procedures. Blood Transfusions. There is one thing that has saved life, an infusion of blood from one person to another, but this would be difficult and perhaps impossible for you to do. I merely suggest it. Medical Ministry, page 286 and 287, to Dr. D.H. Kress. Vaccination. Vaccination for smallpox. D.E. Robinson, one of Mrs. White's secretaries, under the date of June 12, 1931, wrote as follows concerning Mrs. White's attitude towards vaccination. You asked for definite and concise information regarding what Sister White wrote about vaccination and serum. This question can be answered very briefly for so far as we have any record, she did not refer to them in any of her writings. You will be interested to know, however, that at a time when there was an epidemic of smallpox in the vicinity, she herself was vaccinated and urged her helpers, those connected with her, to be vaccinated. In taking this step, Sister White recognized the fact that it has been proven that vaccination either renders one immune from smallpox or greatly lightens its effects if one does come down with it. She also recognized the danger of their exposing others if they failed to take this precaution. Signed, D.E. Robinson. X-ray treatment at Loma Linda. For several weeks, I took treatment with the X-ray for the black spot that was on my forehead. In all, I took 23 treatments, and these succeeded in entirely removing the mark. For this, I am very grateful. Letter 30, 1911 to her son, J.E. White.